Hey guys, what's up? This is uh, Shot Science Overtime number 79. Uh, I'm Casey, this is Coach Tom, and we are Shot Science Basketball. Uh, so today what we're going to do is what we do every week. We have a topic that we talk about at the top of the show, and hopefully it's something that's interesting to you guys that will help you a little bit in making you a better player, and then we're going to jump into taking questions from you guys and giving our answers to your questions. So if you have questions, the best thing you can do right now is to send them to us. We are... Uh, at Shot Science on Twitter. You can also send them to us on Facebook and Google+. We are Shot Science on all those places. Um, and you can also try to catch us in the comments of our YouTube video that's streaming right now and in the Q&A app on Google+. So you can hit us in lots of different places. And definitely send us your questions. If you have any questions on basketball, it could be shooting, dribbling, passing, defense, uh, you know, plays, teamwork, whatever it is, leadership, how to get more playing time, you name it, we've probably talked about it, and we'll talk about it again. Um, so send us your questions. We need your guys' help because the more you go out there and tell people to watch the shows, the more we can go out there and get uh, more great guests for you guys. So make sure you go out there and uh, tell people to check out the show, okay? All right, so we're, today our topic is uh, the Paul George incident and how to prevent injuries. Um, so if you guys uh, probably have, I mean, you must have heard by now, Paul George, he was playing in a Team USA basketball scrimmage, uh, blue versus white game on Friday, and he went up to block the shot of James Harden in transition, and he was kind of soaring through the air, came down on the basketball stanchion or the, back, or the uh, support for the basket, and caught his leg a little awkwardly, and then it just kind of, when he hit the floor, it, it broke, and he had a... Both, a, both broke, right? Yeah, well, he had a compound fracture of his leg, um, so that means that, you know, the, the bo both bo bones broke in his leg, and, you know, they were sticking out of his skin, which is horrific, um, and, uh, you know, it's one of those things where you have these huge human beings, you know, I mean, he's 6'8", six, 6'9", six, himself, and he's coming from three or four feet in the air and, and you know, mm. landing. Um, and it's it's just really, really sad that, you know, something like that happens. But it is kind of a freak occurrence. Um, you know, we saw a similar thing like that happen to him or happen to Kevin Ware, uh, you know, a year and a half ago when, uh, you know, Louisville and, and Duke were playing each other. And, you know, Coach K was at both of those things. So that's kind of a scary, horrific thing for him <laughs> to see. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's one of those things where, you know, it, it, you're playing a sport and things like that can happen. And, um, you know, you can only do so much in preventing injuries like that. Um, that's a pretty freak injury. Right, right. It is freak. You know, um, that probably is, is really a, a truth of the case you just spoke there is that there's going to be obvious injuries when we compete in athletics and some of them are going to be minor and some of them are going to be severe like the Paul George incident. And, you know, there, what, what you would do or as a player or maybe even as a coach is to make sure that you are well conditioned. One of the things that happens is that when we're not very good conditioned and we play, uh, we have more of a tendency to strain muscles or uh, turn ankles. You know, the knees and ankles are two of the most uh, uh, poorly stabilized uh, joints in our body. And basketball players tend to uh, tear the knees and the ankles up more than any other, just because of the stress and whatnot that is put on those joints. And they are not very stable laterally, and uh, you can tear ligaments uh, and muscles as well. And uh, certainly the same thing in the ankles. Uh, you can roll an ankle there that uh, you can tear ligaments loose and has to be surgically repaired. Uh, but fortunately, not too many people <coughs> have it that severely. Usually what happens is maybe you maybe get a little bit of a tear or you strain that muscle. And then after a few weeks, you're able to kind of get back and get going again. But uh, you can really do quite a bit just uh, uh, to make sure that your legs, uh, and that's where we have most of those injuries we're talking about, that your legs are well prepared for competition. And one of the things that happens uh, is that, um, you know, coaches try to condition their teams before they go play, and they're trying to condition them so that they have, um, you know, the, um, what's the word I'm searching for? Um, 
the ability to compete over a longer period of time. Uh, and so they develop their aerobic uh, strengths and that sort of thing, but also their muscular strength is an important part of that too. Yeah, um, but you know, like we were talking about with Paul George, it's it's one of those things that you know that's you could probably be in in the greatest condition possible, which I'm sure he probably is, and you're going to have something like that happen, and uh, you know you really just have to uh, put put that behind you and and move forward and try to recover. Right. Um, you know, that's the same kind of sad story about uh, Derrick Rose. You know, he's had two major setbacks in the last couple of years, and he hasn't even played really um, in the last two or three seasons just because of, of bad bad injuries to his knee and, um, you know, kind of freak occurrences. And, you know, you really have to uh, be able to recognize that things like that happen and you have to be able to work past them and, and come back. I mean, right. you could spend a lot of time being bummed out and, uh, you know, feeling sorry for yourself, and that will never get you anywhere. Right. Um, you know, Paul George tweeted, like, right after, a few hours after, saying that he was doing okay and that he would be back better than ever, um, and that's kind of the positive outlook that you have to have. Otherwise, you know, you're, you're, you're destined to just fade away and, and never do anything again. And, right. you know, he could do that, um, if you didn't have a positive attitude about it and want to work to come back. And, you know, the same thing is true with, with any of you guys. Like if you, uh, you know, sprain your ankle or break a, break your arm or something like that, those things happen all the time. Right. And you could feel sorry for yourself and think, oh, man, what am I going to do? Uh, you know, I can't shoot for, for a, you know, two months or something like that because I broke my arm. Um, and the thing is, is like, well, what can I do? I can work on my uh, offhand dribbling. I can work on my conditioning and, you know, the rest of my body. Um, you know, I can work on developing court vision. Um, I can work on those left-handed layups that I'm terrible at. You know, uh, there's so many things that you can do. And, you know, I'm sure that that's something that somebody like Paul George is going to be doing is just spending his time uh, working around that injury, um, trying to condition himself and build himself back up. Um, and it's probably going to be one of those things where he's going to be out for a year plus. Um, you know, they're saying that he probably is not going to even have an opportunity at all to play in the 2014-15 season. Um, they say that, you know, you're not really supposed to even walk on your leg if you compound fracture it like that for like six months. So, uh, you know, he's he's off his, his leg for at least six months. And then you got to think, oh, well, he's got to build himself back up to being able to, to play um, you know, that's probably at least another six or seven months after that. Um, and you have to be really in the right mental space to be able to get past that because that's, that's one of those things where you look at the long term on that and it's like, I, I'm out over a year? Like, what am I supposed to do? Yeah. I'm sure he's probably never spent more than a, you know, a week off his feet not playing basketball. And, uh, you know, the thing about it is that, uh, you know, you have to take it in small increments. Okay, so today I got to do this. Uh, you know, I, I, and tomorrow I'm going to do this. You don't want to be looking at, you know, next year at this time I'm going to be here because that, that might be super overwhelming. Yeah. Um, but, you know, here's the other thing. For you guys, in how to prevent injuries, number one, you cannot. They will probably happen at some point. You will do something, whether it's spraining your finger, jamming your finger, breaking your arm, twisting your ankle, all that stuff. If you're playing in athletic sports, uh, they can happen. You can injure yourself playing golf, bowling, uh, playing badminton, all those things. You could hurt yourself doing that stuff. What you can do, though, is that you can reduce your your injury, uh, you know, the, the occurrence of your injuries. So you can do that by doing some of the things we talked about a little bit earlier. Um, working on having proper balance throughout your body. So that means that, uh, you know, you're able to perform things on your left side as, as you are on your right side. No, no part of your body is overdeveloped as compared to the opposing part of your body. So, you know, your biceps are not going to be jacked and your triceps are going to be, you know, extremely small. You're able to do uh, a pistol squat on your left side as you are to do, able to do it on your right side. Um, you know, uh, working on balance. If you're able to balance, that's going to, uh, you know, give you better body control. So, uh, you know, if you're able to stand on one foot on your right foot and stand on your left foot and do different uh, things with your upper body, that's going to lend to you being able to perform better on the court and reduce your injuries. Um, One of the other things that really comes <clears throat> into play there too is, is um, 
taking and making your muscles a little more elastic, and yep. you can do that by a uh, stretching program where the, actually the tissues get stretched out a little bit more. Not static and, stretching, though. No, <laughs> dynamic stretching. And, uh, and that kind of thing really helps for muscle injuries, and so that the stretching part of it would be really good. If you go to our video on, on uh, uh, vertical jump, uh, Chase outlines about a half a dozen uh, stretches there that are really important for uh, everybody, not just basketball players, but any athlete to, to help them uh, in preparation for yeah. the play. Yeah, and the thing about it is that you don't necessarily want to do static stretching where you are just you know, going through a stretch, holding it, and, and hoping that it's going to, to uh, warm your muscle and do all these things. That doesn't happen. What you want to do is go through these dynamic stretches where you're moving through movement patterns, um, you're warming up the muscle while also building up your flexibility. Um, and so the difference is the movement of that stuff. Um, if you're just static stretching, that's not going to really warm you up at all. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, if you're able to go through these different movement patterns, that's going to also help you in applying that to, to uh, how you perform uh, on the court and stuff, too. So right. check out the dynamic stretches. Also, in the same uh, kind of category of flexibility and mobility, check out um, foam rolling, too, because if you're able to uh, work out those uh, adhesions in your muscles which are just like bound up knots in your in your muscles, uh, if you're able to work those out, you're going to be able to utilize more of that muscle fiber in your in that whatever muscle that is that you're trying to, to use. And also it will help you with your flexibility as well. Um, so, you know, being flexible obviously is going to help you a ton. Uh, you know, one of the things that we always see a lot of is people that have little to no uh, flexibility in like their ankles or their their Achilles and you know they're not even able to squat down on both feet flat on the ground and hold it I mean that's that's you think about that being super simple but a lot of people can't even do that um, and just working on things like that will help you be a more well-rounded athlete and we got the sirens going on in the background <laughs> um, so uh, you know the thing is is that you want to really work on your conditioning work on your flexibility, work on your balance, and really just generally take care of your body. Um, you know, some of the things that you can check out too, and you know, we have a few things on our on our channel that go through this, um, like dot drills and, and uh, anything from the uh, vertical jump videos, but also you can check out Alan Stein's stuff, and he shows you a bunch of different exercises you can do to kind of reduce injuries in your, in your knee, so like ACL, MCL, PCL stuff, meniscus, um, also, uh, your ankles, and you know some of that stuff is just um, helping you develop uh, kind of lateral movements, um, get some resistance using bands and things like that, and just generally uh, kind of putting those ligaments uh, through greater ranges of motion and things, um, and building up the strength of the stabilizer muscles that are really important as well. So check out that stuff from Alan Stein. Um, you know, the other thing, too, is to consider is to use, if you have to use braces for any anything, uh, you know, like ankle braces or whatever, is that you get ones that are not going to just lock in your ankle, which, you know, I mean, that doesn't sound great, but the thing is, is that if you think about it, if you suck in your ankle and you have that thing that it, it just will not move, you're putting all the shear force right into your knee. And what can, what can happen then is that if all the force is going into your knee and your ankle doesn't give at all, then you'll wind up with kind of these really gnarly injuries to your knee. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's one thing to consider. Um, there's a lot of things, you know, you want to talk to your doctor or physical therapist or whoever, but uh, definitely things to consider. Okay. So what we're going to do now, are, are you done with that? Well, you know, uh, there's one thing I want to mention too is an awful lot of uh, young players get these very elastic um, um, ankle braces with the idea that they will give them support. Well, they are so elastic, they don't really give you much support at all. Um, now, certainly there is a the opposite end of the spectrum probably are the ones that just lock your ankle in completely. But the thing that is really important is that if you're going to wear those braces, find some that are going to be fairly stable. If they're elastic, then they're not going to do you any good. Okay, last comment on that one. Yeah. Um... So I think we're going to end it there. Uh, you know, we just we hope Paul George is on the fast road to recovery because you know he's one of those great players in the East that makes the East even worth watching. <laughs> so uh, hopefully he'll be back soon. 
Um, and uh, yeah, I mean that's that's a crazy injury, and hopefully nothing like that happens to anybody again soon. Yeah. Okay, so what we're going to do now is we're going to transition over into answering questions from you guys. So if you have questions, make sure you send them to us. We are at Shot Science on Twitter, and that's the best place to catch us. Um, if you want to just tweet them to us, we will get right back to you. If you want to leave it in the chat for the video, we will try to get to as many of those as possible. And you can also send it to us on Facebook, Google+, and in the Google Plus app. All right, so let's jump into a question here. Um, this one is from James Anderson in the chat, who says, how do you become comfortable dribbling under pressure because there's a lot of drills that help you, uh, that help your handle, but not when somebody is riding you down the court? Please help. Well, one of the most important things probably to do is when you feel your skill development has is, is reached a, a certain point is then get someone that will work with you that kind of can put that kind of pressure on you. Uh, that's probably the best thing because as they are putting pressure on you, you're figuring out what you need to do to combat that. Maybe they're, uh, they reach uh, uh, and, and you need to learn how to take care of the basketball when they're reaching and how to use your body and protect the basketball with a forearm and, and set and that kind of thing. So the most important thing as far as, as I'm concerned is this, is that uh, when you reach that point is get somebody that you can use to defend you while you're developing those skills. Yeah, I mean, it comes down to the three pillars of practice. Um, you got to be able to slow everything down, do the diligent practice where you're working by yourself. Um, you know, you're breaking down each and every little element of, of your, what you're trying to develop in the mechanics. Um, and then what you want to do is step it up to the second pillar add in uh, game speed, game intensity, so that way you are getting somebody out there that's either defending you or you're pretending, visualizing somebody is the, actually there, upping it to game intensity, um, then going through the performance of that. Then the third pillar is actually playing in game experience or getting game experience with that stuff. So if you're uh, working on your, your uh, you know, dribbling under pressure, uh, you know, now you're in the game and you're just getting experience doing that, and you have to do that. Otherwise, you can't just expect to step out on the floor and have everything be ready to go. Yep. You have to be in that position at some point already. Um, okay, and that means you can play pickup games, uh, you know, uh, practice games, whatever. It doesn't have to be, uh, you know, sanctioned game or anything yep. like that. Okay, this one is from Alex Sutton, who says, Are there any basic exercises that can reduce the chance of injury for basketball? Yes. There's, there's some that we just talked about, but, uh, you know, going through a lot of lateral movements, I think, is one of the major inconsistencies for people or, or things that they uh, overlook. Um, so uh, doing stuff like uh, side steps or side, uh, you know, step drag stuff, um, dot drills are great for that kind of stuff, La ladder drills are great. Um, Alan Stein does a ton of stuff uh, on this stuff where he is using uh, resistance bands and things like that. Um, but just going through lateral movements, um, helping develop your balance is really important. Um, so doing stuff on single foot is, is great. Um, yeah, so I would check out all that stuff and just check out some of the stuff that Alan Stein does too. He will help greatly. Um, and we will have, we definitely have more stuff on that soon. Okay, this one is from, hold on, let me pull it up here. This one is from Paul Bake. Or Bayek, who says at or who is at P Bayek eight two one eight two nine on Twitter. Jeez, mm -hmm. he says, "What is the best method to improve my shot?" Oh gosh, um, form shooting drill. Well, you know, one of the best ways to do it is decide uh, what kind of a, a system that you want to use, uh, whether it's ours or somebody else's, and then work on it uh, to the point where you feel pretty good about it. And and as you're developing that, uh, video yourself. That really helps a ton. Um, one of the uh, guys that I'm kind of familiar with uh, that teaches uh, shooting also, he likes to use mirrors. And I think that's a great idea because you can't really see what you look like when you're shooting. Mirrors? Yeah, they use mirrors. And as you put it against the wall and as you're shooting, you can see yourself in the mirror and visualize what it is that you're doing. You can do that uh, uh, as you're facing best pretty good. But um, most of all, find out a system that you want to use and um, then move from there. And, and that decision probably is one that you just have to experiment with. Uh, we feel like what we present for uh, shooting skills uh, are really uh, solid. 
Uh, they've been taught like this for a long, long, long time. Uh, and they still hold true today the, as much as they did maybe 40 years ago. Yeah, but you know the thing about us, too, is that we, we evolve with new information. Oh, yeah. if, if we yeah. see something that we think needs to be changed, then that's, yeah. that's what we do. Um, and, you know, that's, that's the whole thing about uh, you know, shooting efficiency. Like, right. we, have, we have moved towards the most efficient shooting form that you can possibly have. Very true. Um, and when we think about developing uh, the mechanics that we put into our shooting method, that is where we come from. We want to make it the simplest approach possible because if you do that, what happens is that you eliminate variables. And if you eliminate the variables uh, or reduce the variables down, uh, there's less things that can go wrong. Uh, the more stuff that you add into your shooting mechanics, they're just areas where where things can degrade. And it, you know, shooting is all about repeatability. You want to have uh, that sh your shot looking the same every single time because if you're able to do that, repeatability adds to accuracy. Accuracy leads to actual baskets and points. So, got to work on that. Form shooting drill is huge. Yeah, you know, uh, usually when I start teaching somebody how to shoot the basketball, they have some kind of a stroke already, and for the most part, uh, uh, they wouldn't be there if they wanted if they were happy with what they're doing. So we try to rebuild a shot for them, and it usually takes us uh, a couple of weeks to kind of get it shaped properly, and then they have to do a bunch of homework on their own. And when they come back, we t we tinker with it to try and get it to be uh, the point like Casey's mentioned, more efficient and more efficient. And as that happens, then they begin to exhibit way more success on their shot, and then they're kind of off. Uh, the average person, as far as the stuff that we teach, typically uh, tends to make really good progress in about three to four weeks to the point where they could maybe use it uh, when they're playing. Now, um, to be very honest, whoever is learning how to uh, a new system, how to shoot, don't expect that one day you're going to go out there and be able to just stroke the ball. It doesn't happen that way. It takes a while for you to establish the muscle memory for these new motions and to erase the muscle memory of the older ones. And so for somebody to tell you that uh, you can come out in an hour, you can be able to shoot uh, uh, eight of ten threes, uh, that's not real. That's not real. Yeah, I mean, you might see some minor immediate results, but mm -hmm. that's probably just because you're putting the effort in to <clears throat> make yourself a little better. But well, you get better. Uh, but that might not be there tomorrow or the next day. I mean, you have right. to keep consistent with it. You do, and you you're going to get better from day to day. There's no question about that. But usually, to the point where you can actually kind of use your stroke, somewhere is in that three to four week range when you play. Use that stroke when you play. Yeah, and you have to use it. So, you yeah. know, if you are going out there to practice, you can't just expect to go out there on Sunday, uh, put in five hours, and then have it be there on Friday, right. the next Friday. Because if you think that, uh, you know, you're going to end up just being, uh, you know, the guy that sinks one of eight or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so make sure that you're putting in consistent time, and that might just be 30 minutes a day, which is better than five hours on one day. Exactly. Um, okay. Let's see here. This one is from Rebound King, who says, "What are your guys' thoughts on throwing elbows in a game and/or playing dirty, like jabbing and other stuff?" We're not into that. No, it's, it's that's not that's a not... part of the game. Uh, you know, some of that has emerged over the last maybe 20, 30 years, just by people trying to intimidate other people when they play. And intimidation factor is supposed to make you uh, be able to, su to subdue them. One of the things, in case I can tell you this from experience, is that when you ignore that, um, you know, the talking especially, but throwing elbows, stuff like that, uh, usually um, when you retaliate, uh, which almost happens to everybody, uh, usually that resolves it right there. But it's not a part of the game that we support at all. Well, here's my thoughts on it. The people that get into that kind of stuff are typically the ones that are not very good players. Yeah. Um, so they're trying to make up for their deficiencies by being kind of a, a intimidation factor or exactly. just a jerk. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that's, that's a really poor way to advance yourself in, in basketball. Um, you know, people that really are intimidating and... and kind of strike fear into their, their opponents are the ones that just, they're going to go out there and drop 30 points, not the ones that are going to throw 30 elbows. And talk to you the whole time. Yeah, I mean, yeah. that's just a that's just you, you know, kind of uh, playing down on a lower level. If you really want to be uh, just a, you know, crazy uh, intimidation person, intimidating person, build your game up. Spend your time on that stuff. I mean, that's, like, people like Derek Rose, um, who are some other guys that are just kind of uh, 
uh, Dwayne Wade, um, Steph Curry. These are guys that are not going to be necessarily intimidating to the other guys that are inches taller and tens of pounds, you know, more in in weight or in, you know muscle bound and all that stuff. But they are going out there and they're the ones scoring. 30, 40 points on everybody, and nobody wants to play against those guys because they're just killing them every game. So be that guy. Don't be the guy that's throwing elbows. I mean, there's no real point in it. You'll get caught. Yeah. Um, that's not to say that you shouldn't play tough and learn how to use leverage and not let people push you around um, and just being a, a force. Just don't be a jerk. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> truly. Um, okay, you guys, make sure you send us some Twitter questions. We're not getting very many Twitter questions this time, and those are the ones that we like to answer first. So send us the, those questions. Go out and tell your friends and family to join in the chat because we, we love having more people here, and it just helps us get more cool people on the show. So please help us out with that stuff. Um, let's see. This one is from Chris Bowles, who says, I can get my head close to the rim when jumping off of one foot, but when I try to dunk, jump off of two feet... I can't get nearly as high. I don't understand how to jump with two feet when running. I stumble around a lot when trying it. Do I need to work on my footwork, or what do you think? I think we may have answered something similar last week, but the the real answer here is that you just have to work on the mechanics of it. you got to slow everything down, uh, work on the footwork. Um, you know, Some of that is going to be kind of working on the one-two into that two-foot explosion off the floor. So uh, you know, if you're running down on a fast break or something like that, uh, you have to kind of get the footwork down um, and the last two steps, it's going to be essentially just a lead foot, trail foot, one, two, up kind of, of footwork. And, you know, you need to work on that on both sides of the of the basket using different feet, um, right? Yep, yep, yep. One of the things they're going to say is this kind of is, is uh, saying the same thing as Casey's saying in a different way, and that is sometimes when we are jumping, we have a tendency to jump too much horizontally when we're trying to dunk the ball, and whereas we want to get vertical, and what he was saying there makes really good sense, is that it's one, two, and up, uh, so that you do not, you want to jump vertically, you don't want to jump horizontally. Here's another thought, too. Um, uh, this young man here is saying uh, that uh, he can jump higher off of one, is that what he said? Yep. Uh, than he can off of two. You know, you'd think you'd be able to be a lot more explosive off of two feet, but one of the things that happens is that if, when you jump off of one leg, the other leg is actually brought up typically in, in part of that jumping action and it helps to elevate you just a little bit. The other thing that happens is that when you jump off of one foot, uh, your shoulders will rotate and you'll actually pick up about three or four inches just in the rotation of your shoulders. When you jump off of both feet, you tend to end up with your folders, your shoulders kind of being kind of level and you can't reach as high. So uh, when you jump off of one, your shoulders rotate and you get a few inches higher that way too. Yeah, and you know, the thing is, you have to work on the footwork. Yep. Uh, you can't, ex and the other thing is, you can't just expect because you can do one thing, you should be able to do the other yeah. thing without putting in the effort. Yeah. Um, you know, there's some people that can jump much better off of two feet, and when they try to do one foot, you know, they look like uh, newborn giraffes or something. Yeah. you got to really, uh, if you have a weakness, and this is with, true with anything, whether it's, in, you know, a skill or athletic, uh, you know, some athleticism point, uh, you have to work on developing that. Right. Uh, just because you ha have one set of that athleticism or skill going doesn't mean that it translates directly to the next. You have to really get the mechanics of everything going. Okay, this one is a long question from the cue baller 2690 who I'm going to paraphrase a little bit. And they're talking about ankle braces and specifically ones that uh, allow for movement and mobility and then talk talking about uh, some, that some athletic trainers tell you to allow your ankles to flex and be mobile and suggest not wearing high tops and wearing low tops um, and taping and all this stuff um, and then asking kind of what our, our opinion is on that. Well, you know, for me, I think uh, you have to work on develop. If you're going to, I think it's better to wear nothing uh, personally because I think that you build in uh, imbalances and stuff if that's what you rely on all the time. So I think the best thing that you can do is really work on building up your the strength and the mobility and, and stuff like that in your ankles and knees and all that, doing the drills like uh, that we show in the Vertical Jump Handbook and the dot drills and ladder drills and the stuff Alan Stein shows you. If you work on building that stuff up, then you should really start working towards wear, not wearing braces and things that limit your mobility because those things will help you 
in the long run if you have that stuff going for you. If you are forced to wear things like ankle braces or knee braces and stuff like that, then I think it should be, you should try to make, keep that a short-term thing where you're working on developing the strength and all that in those joints uh, while you wear those during competition or whatever. Um, but my concern is that if you have uh, an ankle brace or something like that or even some certain high-top shoes that just are sucking you in and that your ankle has no give in it, you're essentially putting all of that sheer force into your knee. And what can happen there is that you can you could end up having a worse injury in your knee because you were trying to save your ankles. So I think that's one of those trade-off things that you really need to think about. Work, but I would say work towards not wearing any of that stuff just by building up the strength and, and stuff like that in your uh, joints. Yeah, yeah? I agree. Yeah. Um, okay. Here is one from James Anderson who says, I want to be the best defender in my county, but there are... Are, but are there any drills that can help me guard quicker and more explosive players, and how do, do I guard taller players because I'm 6'2"? Well, 6'2 is pretty, pretty tall. That's, yeah, that's that, legit. Yeah, it is. And, you know, it kind of depends on where you're guarding those people as well. Uh, you, if you're out on the perimeter facing and they're facing the basket, guarding them is considerably different than if you're guarding somebody who has their back to the basket and is close, uh, close in. But if you're just talking about uh, the person on the perimeter, uh, you work on step drag, step drag in, in, in different directions just a whole ton. And you'll find that you start to get a little better with that each time that you do it. One of the things that we think is so important on defense, too, is that you not stagger your stance. You don't want to have one foot in advance of the other. Um, and, you know. Uh, and the reason is. Well, the reason is, is that. Uh, over the years, coaches teach their players to attack that that foot that is higher. And if I if I am guarding, let's say out on the the uh, left or the right wing, and I've got my left foot forward, and that person attacks me on that side, then I'm vulnerable to them getting by me because I end up rotating my body, and it's just like a gate swinging open. And so uh, we like to teach our players. Uh, and students always to square up to the defender so that they don't have one foot that's above the other one. And it allows you to shuffle your feet from side to side. In fact, if you take a look at our, uh, some of our defensive drills, uh, you'll understand kind of what we're talking about there. Yeah, and you want to be, you want to keep your midline in front of the ball. Not... Well, yeah, one of the things you want to do, and this is something that, uh, you know, has been around forever, is put your nose on the basketball. If the basketball is over here, then that's where you need to be uh, with your nose. And you, that keeps your body on the center line of that basketball. And some people will say, well, they can swing the ball to the opposite side. Well, truly, but then you can shuffle to that side as well. And you have to learn how to do that. Now, one of the things that players do, they'll take and bring the ball under their knees or they'll bring it across their nose and take it from side to side. And so what does that leave for you to do? Well, the most important thing for you to do is to shuffle those feet very quickly to get uh, so you're in better position if it goes from one side to the other. Now, one of the things you'll see in one of our videos uh, that I think Chase... Uh, it's Defense 101. Yeah, it's Defense 101, where you actually have one hand that is elevated and one that is down uh, uh, toward the floor. Tip hand, rip hand. Yeah, it's tip hand, rip hand. And the, the rip hand is the hand that is extended down low, and that is to be able to possibly get a deflection on a crossover dribble. And so a lot of people, when they learn that, they bring the ball, their, their hand back between their knees, but you have to have it extended out in front of you so that it's there to possibly uh, deter or deflect a basketball that maybe is used in the cross. And the other hand is up and, and in the passing lane and making it difficult for you to throw the ball. And that hand follows the ball as well. And so take a look at that video because that probably will help you a ton on defense. Now, one of the other things that, that Chase um, uh, mentions too is, is being a good defender is this. You want to keep the defender between your knees. Uh, once he gets out on one leg or the other, then you can be beaten. And so he, he his, his thoughts and ideas are, are always keep them between your knees because then you're centered up on them or the basketball and makes it difficult for them to do anything. Now, if you take and just have your hands out to the side and you're jumping from side to side with them, 
you may find yourself getting beat. So if you use that rip hand, tip hand idea, and it changes from side to side as the ball changes, as it's, they take it from side to side as well. Yeah, and here's the thing about that. this, is the way that we teach you defense is that it is, it's an aggressive type of action and defense. It's not the sit back and wait defense. It's you are in their face, you're cutting off, uh, their opportunities, you're making it difficult for them, uh, you know, they're going to have problems swinging the ball through their body, they're going to have problems trying to dump it in through the tip hand, or through the, yeah, through the tip hand, um, you know, every time they move the ball, you're readjusting to be in front of it, um, you know, you are, you're, you're just, you're making it difficult for them, you're not just playing uh, traffic cop defense, um, and, you know, the thing for me is this, it doesn't matter how tall the guy is, how big the person is, how quick they are, fast they are, whatever. Beat them to the spot. And if you're playing defense like this, you're essentially already taking away their first step. Because if they're going to do anything with it, they're probably going to have to swing the ball back to go and have a step on you. And by that time, you've recovered. Uh, otherwise, you're standing right in front of them. And if they're going to try to take a, a step with that lead foot on the side of where the ball is, you're already there. But the key is beat them to the spot. If they go on you, you jump there before they're able to get there, and either they're going to run into you and get a charge, or you shut off that that uh, path in the lane. So you really have to play actionable defense, beat them to the spot. Doesn't matter if they're quicker, bigger, faster, jump higher, more athletic, uh, you know, green, blue, you know, what? It doesn't matter. You jump in front of them and cut off their 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 you know beat them to the spot. They they can't do anything. And I know that sounds like a big, uh, you know, kind of a thing to say. But the fact of the matter is, is that you'll be able to anticipate where somebody's going to go. Yeah. So beat them to the spot. Some other thoughts on that that probably uh, are really important as well, and that is this. Uh, one of the things... About, I have another good one, too. All right. One of the things about uh, defense is you need to have pressure on the guy with a basketball. If you take and give him room... Mm -hmm actionable room where he can go someplace, then he's probably going to beat you. But if you get up into his space, and I don't mean belly button to belly button necessarily, but you're up into his space and making him feel somewhat uncomfortable, uh, then he's going to be more likely to maybe turn his turn away from you uh, and, and uh, uh, not be able to be as accurate when he's throwing passes back to the other side. But even more important than that is this is that when you're playing team defense and it's one-on-one -on -one with you and the other person, it's not really one-on-one. -on -one. What it is, it's one-on-five. Uh, your five defenders are right there to support you if that person is able to get by you. And understand that on defense, uh, players are going to beat you from time to time, no matter how good you are. Uh, you can see that at all levels of basketball. In the pros, you see that there are guys who get crossed up and they get beat. And the, But the thing that is really important is that your teammates are there in a position to support you so that that person doesn't get all the way to the basket. Now, I have to tell you, I'm watching a lot of pro basketball uh, over the years. That doesn't always happen on that level because an awful lot of guys will not take and step in and, and take the charge or step in to close off a seam. Or they, even flash in to, to make them decide to do something. Right. Right. Um, they often use uh, uh, what we call uh, traffic cop defense, where you just throw an arm out there and that's supposed to stop them. Usually it results in a foul, but just kind of remember that is no matter how good you are, somebody's going to be able to go by you at some point, and just you're, you should be supported by your other teammates. Uh, and a seam is an, as, is an opening between you and one of your defenders or one of their offensive players. And if they can beat you and get into that seam and they get through there with no uh, inhibitants from your support, then uh, there's nothing you can do about that. Yeah, and the other thing, too, that I, that I thought of when you were talking was um, don't let them get the ball. Yeah. Uh, you know, deny the ball. Uh, you know, f from those guys. So, you know, the, you know they're not going to probably, unless they're the point guard, they're probably not going to come up the floor with the ball. Don't let them get it. Get in the denial, get out in the passing lane, uh, you know, play good defense, be on your toes, watch what they're trying to do. If they're trying to do some uh, movement without the ball, cutting or whatever, you're going to beat them to the spot, anticipate where they're going to be. Just make it tough on them. If they can't get the ball, then they're not going to be able to do anything with the ball. So, uh, you know, that's probably the best advice that you can give somebody when they're going up against somebody that's quicker, more explosive, whatever. Do not let them get the ball. And they, they will get the ball eventually, but don't go in with that mentality. Go in with, this guy's not going to get the ball, ever. Um, I'm going to be in the passing lane. I'm going to follow him everywhere he goes. I'm going to play smart defense. 
all of that stuff will help you in going up against those tougher, quicker guys. Yeah, well, there's another thought, too, and that is this, is that when you pressure that defender, you usually can pressure them further away from the basket. Instead of them being able to set up maybe just above the three-point line, maybe you make them catch the ball five or six feet beyond the yeah, three-point line. push them out. And so by pushing them further away from the basket before they can initiate their offense, certainly you can kind of eliminate the shot because not many guys are going to shoot the basketball from that far. And if that's the case, then you give them a little bit of space and make sure that they cannot take the ball and go by you. But, uh, you know, there's a lot of little things that you can do defensively to make it miserable for that offensive guy. Yeah, I would say go check out our Defense 101 video um, and then go in also with the mentality of who cares if they're quicker, taller, bigger, and more explosive, whatever. You have no control over that. What you have control over is how you play defense and the, the kind of tips and tricks that go along with that. Uh, be smart on defense. And the other thing is is don't play traffic cop uh, you know, stand still, flat-footed defense. Be smart, play actionable defense where you are, uh, you know, make, you're, you're forcing them to do something with the basketball that they're not necessarily prepared to do on their own. Yeah. Um, you know, just make it difficult for them and make them decide to do something. What you know, there's another thought that happens in there is, is oftentimes uh, we are so involved in trying to keep the person in front of us that if they are able to get by us, then we don't respond very well, and we tend to trail them as or they swing go. Swing and poke. Yeah, well, the fact that they maybe get a step on us, and my whole thing on it is this. Recover. You're, you're going to get beat, so what you want is turn and run to recover, and uh, that run means that you're sprinting to a spot where you think they're trying to go and try to get there first and reestablish your position. And before, if you're playing team defense, then your teammates should be able to help you to stop that penetration as well. But always turn and run to reestablish your position. Okay. So this one is from Julian White, who is at JW97, who says, besides high school, what basketball programs can I join, I guess? Uh, my school tryout was sketched last year, and I want to eventually play college. Well, I mean, that's, that's tough. Um, there's uh, traveling teams you can join, club teams you can join. Um, Probably the best thing to do is to get out and start asking people in your area what other kinds of teams there might be. Uh, there may be a whole bunch of AAU-type teams that you can play on, uh, and a lot of the AAU programs are on uh, different levels or different tiers uh, so that, you know, maybe there are some that haven't got really super players, but they're average players and some that's a little better. And then finally at the top of that stack, you come to those who maybe are national level players, but just get out and ask people. It's hard for us to tell you uh, because we don't know where you are and, and that sort of thing, but just get out and start asking people in the basketball uh, realm, coaches and other players and that kind of thing. Yeah, and you know the thing about it too is that it's it's probably it's tough to go from not playing in high school to playing in college. Um, that might be a situation where you have to do a walk on or something like that, but you have to have realist, realistic expectations, right. and uh, you know a lot of people don't have that. Um, so you know it's it's good to kind of know people that you can talk to that will tell you uh, kind of where you might fit in. Um, and are being honest with you about that kind of stuff as well. Right. right. Okay. If you guys want your question answered, you should send them to us on Twitter right now. We are at Shot Science. We're about four minutes away from the lightning round. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, send them over. Um, this one is from Fahad Saeed in the ch in the Q and A on Google Plus. They say, "Do I run slower with ankle braces? I twist my ankle almost every two months, and I'm considering uh, purchasing some protection. What do I do?" Um, I don't think you necessarily run slower with ankle braces, um, but you know I also don't think that that necessarily just buying ankle braces will fix the problem that you have. It sounds like you have some imbalances or uh, kind of in inefficiencies in your ankles. Why not work on building them up? I mean, maybe the ankle braces are a short-term kind of solution, um, but I think the long term is that you should be working on building up your, your ankle strength and flexibility and, and balance and all these things, um, doing kind of uh, the stuff we talked about earlier in the chat. Well, you know, I think probably if they go to Alan's program, a Stronger Team, is that? <clears throat> yep. Um, he will have exercises there on uh, his program 
uh, at how to strengthen those ankles. I think that's that's really a good place to start. Like Casey said, ankle braces are a short-term kind of uh, resolution, not something that you should take and, and just wear forever. Um, one of the things you want to do is strengthen those, and once they've kind of recovered from an injury, then you want to start to strengthen those muscles. And there are a whole bunch of things that you can do, and I know that they're on Alan's program. Yeah, and here's here's kind of like a weightlifting crossover thing that you know I've I've seen a lot of. But uh, there's a lot of guys that that go work out and they do squats or something like that, and they put on a weight belt every single time that they do it, yeah. um, or they wrap their knees up. And you know, sure they're doing 400, 500 pounds or whatever. Um, but then they end up getting injured picking up the groceries or something. And the fact of the matter is, is that they have worn these these devices and supportive devices, and they build in inefficiencies or 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 um, you know kind of imbalances in your muscles. So those supporting muscles are not really there to help you when you're actually doing functional stuff. And so you take off that weight belt, and yeah, you just squatted 500 pounds. But now you're bending over, and that support is not there that you had when you were doing that. And if you pick up, you know, the groceries which weigh 10 pounds, all of a sudden you throw out your back. The same thing kind of applies when you're talking about wearing ankle braces all the time. If you're always wearing these ankle braces, you're kind of making the problem worse because you're not actually working on uh, building up that area. So yes, they're probably a good short-term solution. If you sprain your ankle, you're probably not going to want to step out there a week and a half later, not having some support there. Right. But what you should be working on at the same time is building up that area, doing the stuff that Alan Stein teaches you to do on his channel, uh, working on some of the stuff that we talk, talk to you guys about on athleticism, uh, athleticism on our channel, and building that area up so that you can take those ankle braces off and not wear them. Because what they will do is kind of build up those imbalances and maybe you take it off and you're walking down the street and, you know, you twist your ankle a little bit on the, on, you know, the curb. Now you're in trouble again, and it was just because you didn't work on building up that, that ankle. Right. Okay, so that's our thoughts on that. Um, this one is from Luis Oliveira, who says, Hi, I'm from Portugal. I don't know if someone has asked this before, but what's your advice to pre prevent injuries? The most common ankles, knees, and muscles are in favor of flexibility or just a good warm-up? There's... Those are, those are two things out of many that you need to be doing. Uh, we did talk about this earlier, but you know, flexibility is huge, balance is huge, strength is huge. Um, what else is, uh, you know, just, uh, you know, here's another thing too that I just thought of, is that a lot of people do stuff flat-footed. Um, you know, they're not up on the balls of their feet, so up on their toes and like their forefoot. And if you're always doing stuff flat-footed, that's not really the most, uh, kind of athletically sound way to use your feet and and uh, kind of uh, kind of your balance and, and athletic, athletic movement. So what you want to do is make sure that when you're jumping, you're jumping off your your forefoot and your toes, when you're landing, you're not just smacking down on, onto the floor, you're catching yourself trying to land soft and quiet, um, and that will help you in, in kind of building up those areas as well, is just doing simple things like that, right? Yeah. Uh, but yes, good warm-ups are important, flexibility are important, but all there, there's kind of a full package you need to be working towards. Okay, this one is from Louie in the chat who says, When I shoot, a lot of the time the ball hits my head and causes me to miss. I've tried to hold the ball further away from my head, but this doesn't, doesn't allow me to cock the ball back enough, resulting in me having no range. Where do you recommend to hold the ball before the release? Okay, this, this, this sounds like right up your alley. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. You know, one of the biggest mistakes that young players make, and I don't know how old you are. You could be 50. I don't know. But here, here's the major mistake that we make. We think that all of this power that we, uh, uh, we have in our upper body, our arms, is going to be what gives us the range. <clears throat> your range is not determined by the power in your arms and shoulders, even though it helps if you're built like Dwight Howard or somebody like that. But the upshot of it is, is that the, the range that you get uh, for your shooting needs to come from those muscles of your lower leg. And that includes the core muscles uh, of your body as well. And those particular muscles uh, of the mid and lower body represent probably 80% of the power that you need for your shooting. And about 15 to 20% of it maybe comes from the upper body. What, what you have here is this, the muscles of the shoulders and arms and whatnot 
along with your brain, those are responsible for guidance of the basketball. And they are not, they are not really providing very much power. When they try to get more involved in power, then you start to twist and rack the shoulders and your accuracy just falls off the table. So what you want to do is get that motion so that it's the same all the time and then you learn to add power from the legs. One of the things you'll find in one of our videos, and the name of it escapes me right now, is learn to connect that power to your stroke. Often players will take and the legs will extend and there's a short hesitation and then they shoot the ball and it always comes up short. But as soon as you learn to connect the, the legs and the leg power to your stroke, you'll find that your range is going to increase quite a bit. Yeah, and if it looks like you found some issue in your shot. So you figured it out. That's half the battle. Now what you need to do is go do uh, something like the form shooting drill in the first pillar of practice is to slow down and diligently work on your mechanics. Right. So yes, you're hitting your head with the ball or whatever. Oh, yeah. Stop doing that. Uh, get into the form shooting drill. Start doing things like the one-handed uh, practice where you're getting the ball just in one hand. Grab the ball for a second. All right. This part of it I, I didn't address, but let me do this right now. Alan Stein has a great point on this, is that when you uh, are ready to shoot the basketball, you want your right thumb to be located above your right eye, if you're right-handed, of course. And that the ball wants to be about 8 to 10 inches in front of my face or my body. And that the arm then, when it's in that position, represents the letter L. What happens is this. Is and, that, this and this can move up and down. It can be higher. Yes, yes it can be a little bit higher, no question, but you still want to kind of maintain the letter L. As soon as the arm starts to bend backwards toward your head, it begins to represent the letter V. And what happens when it gets there is that we tend to shoot a flat shot and because the arm wants to extend there. And when we get the ball out and away from our body, what we want to do is elevate our elbow so that it always ends up higher than our eyes. If you go look at our videos on uh, uh, those shooting elements, you'll be able to see how that's done, and we explain it there as well. Yeah, and if you check out the form shooting drill video, you'll see that you know we talk about just having the ball in one hand and working on just getting getting it down without having this assist hand in there. You're you're working on kind of just getting it in there, and you know what happens there is that it kind of forces you to to be a little bit more. Uh, to elevate a little bit more when you're doing that. So uh, the thing is, you figured out the problem. You have to just work on eliminating that. And you, that's when it goes back to us talking about variables. You have to eliminate the variables that are going to complicate your shot. Um, and, you know, that's one of those things is hitting yourself in the head with the ball. You yeah. figured that out. Now you have to work towards eliminating it. You have to put work in, um, but, you know, that's just one of those things. And the form, the form shooting uh, program is the best way to do that. It really is. All right. So this is kind of lightning around here, so uh, let's let's do this. This one is from uh, at jdub97, Julian White again, who says, what important tips do you have when defending the post? Well, it depends on the kind of player you're playing against. Uh, if it's a low post player who's big and strong and can really uh, uh, get to the basket and finish, then our, pitch, our position on it is that you don't let him catch the ball. And you don't let him catch the ball by stepping out in front of him. And you're going to give up something on the rebound probably, but probably not as much as you might think. But get around in front of him. And I personally like this, is I like to have my uh, uh, guys that are defending the post to play belly button to belly button with that person with a forearm in their chest and the other hand extended fully up. And the reason for that is oftentimes players will want to take and toss the ball over the top to the guy, especially if he's bigger than you. And what we found is that when the hand is, is straight up in the air, then that tends to discourage that pass over the top. And even if they do get it in, one of your help side defenders needs to be there to help you with that. But as soon as you let a really good, strong post catch the ball in the middle, he's going to score. And so uh, we like to take and front them up to about eight feet. When they get up higher than that, then we'll take and play them ball side. And uh, very seldom do we want to play right directly behind them. We'll tend to play ball side. Okay? Yeah, that but, but a lot of that is kind of having that help side defense from uh, your teammates. If they're, if, help. if they're not there, then, you know, you, you're probably going to be in some trouble. Yeah. Okay, remember, lightning round. This one is from Abdallah Abdul Razek, who is at 
Oh, man. At only Abdallah on Twitter, who says, have there been any recent news or details on Paul George's injury? What does this injury mean? Well, we talked about that a little bit at the top of the show, but uh, what we've heard is that he has gone through surgery on his leg. Um, they said it went really well. They also said that he didn't tear anything crazy like his ACL, MCL, PCL, meniscus, or uh, other ligaments and stuff, so that's really good. Um, they think that he'll probably not be able to walk in it for like six months, uh, probably be back in more than a year, probably be back to being able to play on it. Um, but, uh, you know, that's pretty much all the, the news that's really out there. Um, but, that, you know, that sounds positive. Yeah. Um, okay, so next one is, let's see... James Anderson says, sorry for so many questions, but how do you stay cool when people talk trash? Because my coaches say all people have to do is talk trash and I'm out of my game. How do I stop that? <laughs> Not worry about it. Yeah, don't listen. You know, it's just an if intimidation you... kind of thing. And it means nothing and should mean nothing. Uh, and, you know, usually if you don't respond to it in any way, and it sounds like your coach is, is saying and that he realizes that you are responding to it, then you, they've got you. And so... Just ignore them. Uh, yeah, if you play into it, you've already lost. Yeah, that's exactly what they want you to do. Be worried more about what they're saying than what you need to get done in the game. So just turn the turn the hearing off. I mean, and what, and what, react. what does it matter what they say? Yeah. I mean, somebody could say anything they wanted to me, and it wouldn't phase me one bit because I know that they're doing that because you know they're concerned about controlling me and, and yeah. trying to take me out of my game. If I think... Just think about how ridiculous it is what they're saying and trying to do. If you take it personal, then that's when it really takes you out of your game. All you have to do is play. You don't have to worry about what anybody else says. Who cares? It's, it's, it doesn't matter one single bit. Okay, this one is from Drim Andrew, who says, Hi, with a smiley face. Hi. Hi, Drim. Um, this one is from Mr. Looking Good 100, who says, My name is Annual. Pronounce Daniel without the D. Hopefully I pronounced that correctly. What workout can I do to work on my speed? There's a lot of things. You can work on doing things like dot drills. Uh, ladder drills are really great. Um, jump rope is great. Uh, uh, plyometrics. Plyometrics. Super... Sprinting. Uh, sprints like... Uh, Short sprints. Yeah, like um, suicides and things like that are great. Um, so check out the stuff that we do in the vertical jump videos that we have, and also check out Alan Stein stuff. Uh, on building athleticism. This one is from Chief Keefe, who says, "How can I get in shape?" Uh, well, you gotta you gotta go out there and condition yourself. So yeah. doing things like we just talked about, but yeah. especially doing things like uh, suicide sprints. Um, you know, also working on uh, your your skills and mechanics and stuff while you're gassed and and fatigued. That's really important. But how do you get in shape? You just gotta go out there and apply yourself and do those different things that that we always talk about every week. Um, let's see, this one is from, let's see, <clears throat> this one is from uh, Luis Oliveira, again from Portugal, who says, for us here in Europe there is this big myth when starting to teach zone defense in youth teams. Um, I guess they, I guess they're, myth. I guess they're, they're, they start them out in playing zone. Uh-huh. Well, I mean, I guess that's one easy way to kind of get out of it if you're if you're. But you know, the thing is, is that there's complexities to zone defenses as well. Um, but you know, if you, if you just send people out there and tell them to play spots, then maybe that's just because they're trying to take the easy way out. Um, but uh, I, I mean, I don't really know what the question is. But you know, we probably would not start a team out playing no. that. We would probably start teaching the the intricacies of man to man. Yeah. Okay, this one is from Steezy Gang, who says, what do you think about squaring and turning your feet? Well, well, one of the most important things we think is to turn your feet so they're in a staggered position. Yeah, it's a slight stagger towards your shooting side. Right, and what that does is that turns your shooting shoulder into the basket. If you're left-handed, of course, it would be the opposite direction. But the important thing is that that helps you have the best orientation to the shot is to stagger your stance. Yeah, your arm is not in the middle of your chest, so you want to start off staggered. The well, other thing is is that you do not want to be doing that in the air. You want no. to be already in that position already because, like we said before, it's a variable. If you're going up into the air and trying to twist, that is a variable. Start with that stagger. Yeah, the other thing is, is that when we square up our feet, 
we tend to square up our shoulders. When we square up our shoulders to the basket, we have a tendency to shoot off our shoulder rather than in front of our shooting eye or above our shooting eye. All right. I think that... Oh, let's take two more. This one is um, from Leandro Hachu Filho, who says, I'm having problems with selling my up and under move. How can I improve to make that my post game better? Thanks for the answer. Greetings from Brazil. You know, one of the things that I've found that, that gives people more problems than anything else on the up and under is that when they step through, they bring the ball down and then they bring it up again. One of the things that we teach our people is that the shot comes around like you're going to shoot it, and then we keep the ball high as we turn and move toward the basket. And that allows us uh, to get the ball free, and we don't have anybody knocking the ball loose from there. And the other thing is it's exposed up there where uh, the officials can hear and see that slapping on the arm as you turn. So as you turn, the, the hands keep the hands above the head as you step toward the basket. Yeah, and for me, I think the biggest thing is that most people do not, they, they try, they have too much movement is what they do. Yeah. When you're trying to sell a fake, especially a shot fake or anything, most of it is in just a little motion. Like if you're trying to do a shot fake, you, you don't want to go whoosh and just fling it up. You really just want to keep it really compact and make it short. Have them expend the energy, not yourself. Right. Okay. This one, and also, I don't know if you've watched the Up and Under Move uh, video that we put together. That might help you as well. Right. Um, let's see. This one is from, th this last one is from Denzel Banks. He says, how do you disrupt someone's crossover? Hmm. Well, I think that the best thing to do is to make sure that you stay in front of whoever the defender or whoever the, your offensive player is because you don't want them to get by you. Um, and then contesting with what we call the rip hand getting that hand out in that area where that ball is going to be crossing through and just making it a, a tough decision for them to actually want to do the crossover. Right. But beating them to the spot, staying in front of them, that is much uh, more important than uh, trying to pick off the ball, though. Right? Right. Okay, so I think that's it for today, guys. We ran a little bit over, but we want to thank you so much for being here. Uh, if we didn't get to your question, it wasn't because we didn't like you. It's because we ran out of time. And you can always send your questions to us during the week, and we will try to get back to you as soon as possible. So you can send them to us on Twitter. We are at Shot Science. You can send them to us on Facebook, on Google+. Um, and also, don't forget to subscribe to us on YouTube because we have videos coming out all the time. And we are here every Sunday from 1 p.m. Pacific time uh, till 2 p.m. Pacific time for live shows to answer your guys' questions. So if you want your question answered during the live show, just get here early, tweet them to us, and we usually get to all the, the tweeted questions, okay? Um, we also want to make sure that you do not go watch the Paul George injury video, um, but just you know have positive thoughts for him, um, and also work towards reducing your injuries by doing all the things that we talked about in this video, okay? Absolutely. Thanks, guys. All right. We will see you guys next time. See ya.